We started uh, we stopped here last time uh, talking about the uh, quick comparison between the circuit switched uh, connection oriented networks and the uh, the packet switched connectionless uh, networks. And uh, we talked about the, the, the main difference. The circuit switched networks they have uh, dedicated circuits temporary circuits that gets established at the beginning so you have to spend some time on making a, a, a connection and in that case the quality of service is guaranteed so uh, you, you, have, you have like a pipe established dedicated for your communication so all the packets and the information flowing through that pipe they arrive in order um, so they have the same behavior more or less the same delay and everything so, um, and we have uh, 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 talked about uh, an example of this or analogy of this, which is like the, the train that goes through uh, the rails in, in one uh, 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 road. So the, the performance or the duration of the trip would be deterministic. And in that case, the quality of service is, uh, is guaranteed. The drawback of this is, is that it's an inefficient use of of, uh, uh, of resources of the network because even if you're not using that dedicated circuit, um, um, the, 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 the circuit will not be used by anyone else, in which case we waste some resources of the network. So to fix that or to resolve that issue, we have talked about packet switched networks where you have everything shared and you don't have any temporary circuits, you don't have any connection time, so once you, you want to communicate, you start communication right away. And uh, in that case, the, the only drawback is that if, if all of us are sharing the same <coughs> resources on the network, then quality of service may vary. Uh, at different times uh, during the day, uh, from one circuit to another, the load might change. <coughs> and that's, of course, similar to the fact that uh, when we all drive a car, when we go through the road, sometimes we find the road uh, uh, blocked, sometimes we find some traffic jams and things like that. So if your way can, uh, is shared by uh, uh, many other uh, users or entities, then uh, your performance or the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the resources that you take from the network are not going to be guaranteed. So. So the, the, the internet itself, um, generally speaking, it uses, of course, um, the, uh, the packet switched uh, paradigm, okay? So the internet itself uses packet switched connectionless oriented paradigm, okay? So um, <clears throat> except for some small uh, uh, networks uh, hosted by a specific entity that uh, chooses to select that, uh, that other type of, of, uh, of communication, but the internet, generally speaking, uses the, or let's say like 99.99% of all the uh, sub-networks over the internet, they use packet switched. So, in order to have we talked about scalability <coughs> on the internet and uh, we said that um, scalability means that when we add other devices or other uh, 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 nodes in the, uh, in the internet, the performance of the existing nodes will not be affected significantly. So uh, in order to provide this kind of scalability over the internet, the, the, the network architecture, of course, is based on the fact that you have multiple uh, service providers uh, who have like some specific network infrastructure and they provide this service to, uh, to the users or to others. So in order to have the scalability over the internet, the service provider architecture adopted in the internet uses some kind of hierarchical model, which means that 
You have multiple service providers over the internet, and by service provider me, we mean that <clears throat> it's a, a company or an organization that has like a networking infrastructure, and they provide the network infrastructure as a service to other, you know, companies or other um, uh, users. Like for example, Redo, um, Vodafone, um, any any service provider. Okay. So, so in that case, uh, to provide the scalability over the internet, these service providers are classified into tiers. Okay, so tier one service providers, these, these providers, they would have very large infrastructure, okay, uh, with lots of redundancy and lots of, um, you know, um, like high performance routers and switches that can provide huge amount of, of resources to others, okay? So usually service providers, they don't deal with users directly. They deal with other service providers. So what happens is that the core of the internet is uh, uh, um, facilitated through the tier one service providers, the core of the internet. So this, um, this uh, tier one service providers they can serve multiple tier two service providers, okay? Uh, an example of this is AT&T and Verizon and some like very few tier one service providers, mostly in the States, some in Europe. Um, but all of, all of these tier one service providers, they have huge amount of infrastructure, okay? It, it is provided, the service of Orido is provided by a tier 1 provider? The, uh, the service of, of, of Orido, Orido is considered a tier 2. Yeah. Uh, a tier 2 service provider. So they actually get the service from a tier 1 service provider. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And they provide this service to tier 3 service providers like the university here. The university is considered like a tier 3. So it's a, a localized... Uh, a service provider, they provide the service to students and within a specific limited location. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, that's why the tier one service provider are, they, they provide international connections. So their, their infrastructure should actually cover the entire globe, basically. So they should be, be able to provide the service to multiple tier two service providers uh, uh, distributed all over the globe. To say they, they are not limited with a specific area or a country or something. These uh, tier one service providers are international in nature, okay? Tier two service providers, they can provide this service, regional service. So they can provide this service within a region that includes multiple, like few countries, small, smaller area, region like GCC or, or, or a small uh, uh, area or maybe a country or maybe one single country if the country is large, okay? And uh, these tier two service providers, they can provide this service to uh, local service providers or what we call them uh, tier three service providers, okay? That, that doesn't mean that tier one and tier two, they don't actually provide the service to users. AT&T still provides service to users as well. Nothing will stop them from doing that. But, um, but their infrastructure is, is large enough in such a way that allows them to mainly provide this service to other um, uh, service providers. And of course, the agreement with the users is not as complicated as the agreement with other service providers. So in order for a service provider to provide the service to an, other companies, they have to have really very sophisticated, detailed agreements, and, and it takes sometimes months to finalize these agreements and stuff. But the, the agreements with the users, like ourselves here, is, is, is very easy and it doesn't take time. So Tier 2 are regional service providers, and Tier 3 are local service providers where they provide this service to only to local users, like within a small area of, you know, like or a building or few buildings and things like that, okay? 
So this type of hierarchical service provisioning allows for the scalability of the internet that we talked about. Okay, so this um, uh, this allows any any company really, like even a startup company, to 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 decide to take that as a business and provide uh, 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 internet services to to others. All they need to do is just to to get that service from a tier one service provider or tier two service provider, and then they need to have like some pool of 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 uh, users uh, who can get this service and then uh, through having a specific infrastructure they can provide different types of services to users or to other companies okay so that's uh, this is the first uh, part in chapter two again we're still we're still talking general high level but here we'll we'll just get the global picture where we just talked about you know, like some general applications and how network is affecting our way of life, our, our work on a daily basis and, and things like that. And we talked about general features. Um, we didn't talk about the, 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 the network itself as a platform and how, how is it, you know, uh, composed and, uh, and what are the main components inside the network. So this chapter touches on that, tries to explain again in a high level. We did not, we will not get into like um, the details of the uh, of the internet and the the layer structure that we will talk about in this chapter. But this chapter is again still high level. Okay. <clears throat> um, so so network as a platform or the communication as a platform. First we. Um, uh, uh, the the communication happens as as we said before between like one sender and one receiver, and here we have the network, right? So here we could have um, we could have many uh, routers and switches on the way that are not actually clear here or they are not appearing in that picture. But the way it happens is that for uh, in a high level from the application from the application perspective. The, there is a message source which, for example, composes a, a message that consists of possibly like a web page or maybe a, a graphic or something like that. So this graphic gets into the, uh, uh, the, the network interface card or the hardware inside uh, your, your machine which is responsible for interfacing with the network. Okay. Before it gets to that, it uses some kind of encoder. The encoder is, uh, is a software. It's just a software. It's just a program that runs behind the scene. And it, 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 what it does is that it takes the information and then it encodes it into binary numbers. Because at the end of the day, we need to send binary, binary data. Okay? So whether it's... Um, <clears throat> Whether it's a, a web page that, that's composed of some text or video or audio or graphic or something, everything should be, at the end, uh, 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 um, composed into binary numbers, okay? Um, and then we, um, uh, we use a transmitter. A, a transmitter is the, is the network card, which takes these ones and zeros and then tries to send them over the network. And in order for it to do that, it has to really put the data, the binary data, into chunks. And I posted, um, I posted uh, a YouTube video over the, uh, on Blackboard. I'm not sure if you have noticed. But this one will give you a very, very nice and visual uh, uh, idea about how the information goes from the beginning, from the moment it's composed, and then it has to be cut into pieces and put into like a car or... or it's, it's, it's really nice. It gives you a very detailed idea visually about how we actually compose this information. So I, I really encourage all of you to, to, to go through that video. So the transmitter then takes the, uh, 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 the, the ones and zeros and then it, it divides them into pieces and then it sends them over the medium. 
And the medium here uh, could be, as we said before, could be wired, could be wireless, could be fiber optics, whatever. We'll talk about all these transmission media in a later stage. Until, of course, and, and on the way, it can meet like some switches, some routers, as we will see later. And then the receiver then, it does the reverse operation like the transmitter. So uh, it gets pieces, okay? <clears throat> And then if, if these pieces, they need ordering, they need reordering in the case of packet switch networks or something, then it reorders all these pieces for us. And then it gives us like, again, a continuous stream of ones and zeros, which again goes to the decoder. The decoder will, will get these ones and zeros and then will convert it back into the original form of it, whether it's a, a web page or a audio or a video until it gets uh, uh, displayed again on the uh, on the destination application. Okay. So this one is acting like a server and here it's the client. So the client the client requests a web page. Okay, from the server and then the server will send the content over. So we talked about this transmission when we have the content on a server and we were trying to send this content uh, back to the to the client. Okay, the initial call that the client did is hidden from that picture. We'll talk about it later. Okay. So, so what this uh, slide tries to uh, uh, convey as a message is that theoretically, okay, if if um, if the server or any entity wants to send the information over the network. So this, this, um, uh, 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 this machine will just get all the ones and zeros from the encoder and then it sends it over, over the medium back to the, to the receiver, okay? So theoretically, single communication such as music or video or, or email or whatever could be sent across the network from a source to a destination as one massive continuous stream. Okay, so what is, what is the problem here? If, if that guy is sending a continuous stream of ones and zeros, okay, and he has like a very massive, like a very complicated web page, he or she is trying to send that content over the medium. So, okay, so we'll just send it. Uh, but what, what, what will happen here? A delay for this guy because as we said on the internet we're all sharing this medium this medium is not dedicated for your transmission only so um, so if this guy keeps sending like massive message this other guy will have to wait okay and depending on how large this message is this guy may wait forever okay so so the result is significant delay which is um, Inefficient, um, because the uh, uh, the medium will be almost dedicated, and that's that's what happened for circuit switched. Okay, so um, this guy will have to wait maybe forever if there is no other circuit in the network which can be uh, 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 assigned to him. Right. So, <clears throat> also the the other problem here is that any loss. In the data, if I lose uh, 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 this message, like I'm sending the message as one stream, so either all of it is lost or nothing. So if I lose, I lose the entire message from beginning to end. So any loss means that the whole message is lost. Okay. So these are the two disadvantages for this, for this case. As we said, even for circuit switch, if there is any failure, then the whole, the whole call, the whole connection is done. I cannot do anything about it. What happens, what happens really on, on the internet is that we do something called multiplexing. So this, the, the information from every single person gets divided into pieces. That's why we need to actually divide the information into pieces in order to facilitate the sharing on the medium. Because uh, if, if, uh, if I allow one person to 
to send all his data on the line, then I'm not doing any sharing, which means uh, I'm, I'm, I'm using the resources inefficiently. So, um, what we do is that we do some, some uh, sort of segmentation. Segmentation is nothing but, you know, like dividing the big message into pieces. So we have to segment, <coughs> put it in segments, and then send each segment separately. So if I cut it into smaller pieces, then sending this smaller piece will not take time. And then we'll allow the other person to send one piece from his side. So send one piece from here, one piece from here, and so on. This process, so the, the, divide, the division of this large message into pieces is what we call segmentation. Interleaving these pieces together for multiple users, we call that multiplexing. Okay? So multiplexing is interleaving the, seg the segments from multiple users over a shared medium. Okay, this is the former definition of it. Yeah. How, can, how can we know, for example, that this, uh, the message that is sent, that is segment, mm -hmm. uh, how can they be uh, reordered again? And how can we know that this segment is for this person, the other segment is for this that's person? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. And that's actually one of the drawbacks of this. Yeah. So, yeah, all of a sudden, yeah, that's a very good logic. So... Uh, if I send one large message from one person, then the, 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 the medium is dedicated for that person, and I know that this person is sending, so that's it. So the message is coming now from person X. But now, I'm receiving group of, of segments, okay, one from here, one from there, so I need to know where this is coming from, okay? So first, there is a good advantage of segmentation is that it, it allows the sharing of the medium. And we know that. But we now have to incur some kind of overhead, right? We have to put in the messages itself. Okay? Where is it coming from and where is it going to? Right? So that's an overhead. We didn't have to do for the first case. Okay? But to facilitate the multiplexing, we have to now have some kind of overhead. <clears throat> so multiplexing is interleaving different conversations together. Okay? That we said. And, um, and then now the, the, the main disadvantage of multiplexing is that we have to, eat, to have an overhead to say that this segment is coming from that person and go to that person. Okay? So each one has advantage and disadvantage, and at the end of the day, the, the, the main model on the internet is to use multiplexing for sure, because we cannot afford having a physical circuit, circuit dedicated for, for one person. Otherwise, you have like a submarine cable you know, <coughs> over under the sea, okay? That's responsible for only sending one transmission, which doesn't make any sense. So we need to have this multiplexing. There's no way around it. We have to have multiplexing over the internet. And of course, depending on the medium itself, and depending on the capacity of, the, of that medium, like the width of the pipe, okay? If, if it's too wide, then it can carry like millions of users. If it's uh, uh, relatively small, then it can carry like, it can be shared amongst maybe 10 users, 100 users, and so on. So, this issue we talked about before, communicating the messages itself, that's another uh, 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 difference, on another main uh, characteristic of segmentation is that for segmentation, when we send each message, it can take a different path, right? So, um, um, so in that case, as you said, it may arrive unordered here. And also, um, um, these separate pieces, one of them may get lost. So in order for me to recover this large stream on the other side, <clears throat> I now have to, eat, <clears throat> have to know <clears throat> the order where they originally transmitted. And not only that, when one of these pieces is lost, I need to know which piece, right? Because 
if I know which piece, I don't have to really uh, ask the sender to send me the whole thing again. I, I can just ask for one individual piece to be retransmitted, right? So in that case, the overhead is not, is not that large. Whereas for the first uh, case, if the message is lost, then I have to retransmit the whole thing again. Um, <clears throat> so, so for reliability, each individual piece can, uh, uh, can, if it's lost, then I need to have some kind of overhead in the message to say that I'm message number X. So uh, if I receive, for example, message 1, 2, and then 4, okay, and I never receive 3, then I know that message or segment 3 was, a, was lost. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> if I have any failure in the network itself, like one of the, this router is down, then I know how to, how to recover that. If one router is down, then multiple segments may get lost. In which case, I will recover from that by saying, okay, segment X, Y, Z were lost, then I need to ask for these pieces again. When I ask for these pieces again, I, I don't have to take the same, the same path. If this one is, is, is damaged, for example, then I can take other, in which case I can recover these small segments and then I can here recover the whole uh, stream back to the original and then I can display it. Okay? Mm -hmm. How many um, paths can a router uh, maintain? There's no limit. There's no limit in terms of path. Well, the, the, there are some limits, um, but it's limited with the geographical area because each router contains information about a specific area. Okay? And uh, we'll talk about routing in details. And routing is, uh, has so much you know, details and techniques and things like that. It's really complicated. It's not as easy as you might think. And we'll talk about this in, uh, in, in details. So the, the straight answer to your question is that there are some limits. Um, but in order to talk about this, in order to under, uh, answer it fully, we have to get into routing, and which we will talk about later. <clears throat> okay? So, so as we said, the disadvantage of, uh, of uh, segmentation and, and multiplexing now is that we have to add some level of complexity. Because now, uh, it's like sending like one 100-page uh, uh, letter one page at a time. So we send first page, second page, and so on until the 100th page. So uh, in that case, we need to, to label each page that this is page number one, and page number one is coming from user X and going to user Y. Okay, so um, um, so when when I receive on the on the medium any of these segments, I know that this is sent from user X to user Y, and the label of that is page number two or page number three. So on the other side, I can recover and I can reconstruct the whole letter because if I'm here, if I'm the receiver Y, then I know that I'm receiving pages from X, but not from Z. So any segments that are coming from Z, I don't care about. Any segments that are coming from X, then I have to eat to grab it. When I grab it, they become, they may be unordered. So I need to reorder them. When I reorder them, I find one, two, and four, then three is lost. Then I need to, eat, to go back and ask Mr. X, please send me uh, page number three again. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Segment, do segment a copy of the original message? Yes, these segments are like the original message gets into smaller pieces. We have to wait uh, when we ask some mm -hmm. and we ask again, so we have the original. We have? We have the original. Copy. Yes, of course, the, the, the sender will have the original. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's another good question. So, it's built in in the protocol of transmission that the sender will not give away any segment until it hears back that this segment is received successfully. We'll talk about this. So, uh, if, if, if I send back a request saying, please send me segment number three, I assume that the sender will have segment number three. He did not 
give it away. He did not discard it. Okay? And that's part of the protocol. Because if the protocol says that you get rid of it, if I get any response back saying, I did not receive segment three, I tell him, you know, tough luck. Okay. I'm... So this, this is the reliability. So some protocols, they provide reliability. Um, in that case, they should keep <clears throat> the segments until they make sure that the other side have received it. Some protocols, they do not provide reliability. And we'll talk about some, some of these examples. In that case, it's lost. That's it. If, if it's a video, by the way, sometimes it's okay. If it's a video, this means that one pixel on the screen will not appear properly, which for you, it may not make a big difference. We'll talk about this. Um, so depending on the protocol, it, it may or may not be important that the sender has to uh, keep all the segments until it makes sure that uh, it, they are received successfully. So this added complexity requires some kind of extra overhead. Uh, we need to have in each segment sent, we need to have where it's sent from, where it's going, and so on. So it's, it's, it's a, a complete process. <clears throat> so the components of the, um, of the network, of course, the network is composed of multiple um, devices. Devices include end devices like So end devices like, um, as we said, hosts, switches, routers, cables, and so on. These are, uh, 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 um, sorry, the, the, the cables are the media. So devices like hosts, uh, switches, routers, these are the network devices. And there are media. The media is the, uh, is the, is the medium where the message or the information flows through. And this could be wire, could be wireless, could be fiber optics, could be, could be anything. We'll talk about many of these media. And we have services which are very important. Services are nothing but just software. Software applications that run behind the scene. You don't see them. Okay? It's not, it's not like an end application that has a user interface. These are services <clears throat> that are built into the operating system. You don't actually deal with them directly. Okay, so if you, if you open the, the task uh, information on, the, on, the, um, uh, on Windows, you will not see the services as direct applications. But you will see them if you switch to the services tab these are very important services. These are pieces of software that run behind the scene. And then it takes information from the, from the application and then it performs the, the protocol. These are the entities that really perform the real protocol of transmission. Okay? So this service is uh, software pieces that run on the operating system to perform network, networking tasks like routing, like switching, like, and so on and so forth. Uh, and these are very important, and these are soldiers behind the scene that, that are, you know, um, dedicated for us to perform the networking functionality. But these do not have any, like, actual soft, uh, actual user interface that we can deal with them directly. So these end devices, as we said, these are computers and workstations like end devices. Um, and end devices are referred to as hosts. So uh, a host is um, like a machine or an end device, which we, we, we refer to them as hosts because they host applications. Okay? <clears throat> so they host applications um, um, which... Each application can be a source of information, and then we have to get the information from multiple applications and then send it over the network. Okay, so these are the end devices. End device can, can could be like a networking a network printer, like many network printers that we have in the university here, or voice over IP, like uh, like this uh, Cisco uh, uh, phone set. Or it could be a camera, security camera. 
camera that you know that can be hooked up to the network to uh, send the video streamed to over over the network, or it could be a cell phone and so on. Okay, we call these hosts because again they host applications, and applications can be source of a of information. Uh, the host device can be either a source or a destination of the information. Okay, which is uh, which is easy to understand. So. Each end host takes a very important uh, characteristic, which is an address. Okay? So, we all know the IP address, of course. We, we at least have heard about it. An IP address is, is like an address, unfortunately, nowadays with the, with the, um, uh, with the use of uh, DHCP, nothing, no one has to worry about assigning an IP physically like we used to do in the past. So before using DHCP, we would have to go uh, manually in the, uh, in the operating system and hard code the IP uh, 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 manually in the, in the settings. But now, of course, you don't have to deal with that. With the, with the use of DHCP, we'll talk about what DHCP is. Um, an IP gets assigned to your host automatically. So you don't have to worry about, you don't have to deal manually with an IP. Yet, I think, yeah, all of you, at least you've heard about what IP is at one point in time. Uh, the IP, again, is an address for a host. Okay? So it, it identifies the host itself. Which means that, remember that a host might actually host many applications. Like in our uh, uh, laptops, we, we may have like hundreds of applications, right? All of them, okay, when they get out of that host, they get that, the address, which we call an IP address, okay? <clears throat> uh, doctor, what is IP? IP stands for Internet Protocol, okay? Which is the, uh, we'll talk about it in the routing layer in details. Uh, but for us, for now, an IP is nothing but an address that identifies a host. And at any point in time, physic, physical, where is the physical, the physical address, don't worry about that for now, because this, is, this will be in a later stage. What we need to worry about now is the, is the one that's framed in red, which is the IP address. An IP address is the one that identifies a host. Okay? And at any point in time, this IP address should be unique over the, over the world, which means that if, if I send a segment to a specific IP, from my perspective, there's no one on earth that should have an IP except the one that I mean to send this to. Okay, so there's, there's only, for me, I mean, for, for the sender, um, there's, there's only one person with that address over the internet at this point in time. Okay? It's a unique address. So unique address. It should be uh, a unique no, address. Sir, now, for example, if I turn off the network and uh, restart it again, I will have a new address, an IP? Chances are you will have the same address, mm -hmm. but that's because, again, we're, we're jumping ahead, mm -hmm. uh, because all these things we'll talk about in, in, in details later, but just to answer your question now. There is the, the DHCP server on the, uh, on the university network is responsible for distributing IPs to, to, the, to the machines. So if it identifies that this machine uh, is turned off for a couple of days, okay, and now it started, then it will give it the same IP that was assigned to it two days ago. Okay, unless you keep your, your machine, uh, you know, uh, locked or not working for maybe few weeks or something like that, then chances are DHCP will recycle that IP address and assign it to someone else. In which case, if you start your, uh, your machine again, it identifies this as a new machine coming, so I need to assign it one of the unused IP address, which may be very well, very likely different from the previous one. Um, so again, if, you, if you're not following this answer in details, we'll talk about all of this later. Um, <clears throat> so here it's very important that I need to have the source address and the destination address 
which should be like unique addresses, identifying two machines over the internet at this point in time. Um, address is, is, is one very important um, parameter that we need to, to deal with. Um, a host can act as a client or a server or both. What, what does that mean? A client is an entity or a host that initiates the communication. It asks for a service. A server is the one that provides the service. Okay, for example, when I say www.google.com on my browser, now I'm on the client. I'm requesting a content of the web page google.com from the server. What is the server? Google.com. So it goes to it goes to the server, which is called google.com. We will say how. Okay. <clears throat> how how does it identify the address of the server just from the name of google.com? So we'll talk about that. So there's one entity which is one of the services in the um, in the operating system that takes this words and converts it into an address, an IP address. <clears throat> okay, so one of the services in the operating system which we don't see, it, 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 it's hidden there, it takes the words, it converts it into an address, and then it sends a request to the, to the server that hosts the content of the google.com to request. So now I'm a client, and the server is google.com server. Okay? At, at other points, someone might ask me to provide him a service. Okay? So if you run like an FTP server on your machine, so now you're acting as a server. What's FTP? FTP, like file transfer protocol, is one of the Protocol or anything like if you run a web server on your machine Now your machine can act as a client and at the same time as a server So in that case people might actually write www.abir.com for example and it gets to my laptop it gets to your laptop and then you you have to transfer the content back to them so now your hosts your host act as a, a server or both, which means that you can act as a server or as a client, depending on the, the, the type of, of application you run. If your application is a server application, like an FTP server or Telnet server or web server or something like that, then your machine can act as a server for that particular service. If you just run a browser and you say www.yahoo.com, then this is a you are trying to initiate the communication, which means that you are a client. So a client is always the one that initiates the communication, requests a specific content or service from the server. Okay? Um, okay. That's, and so a host or an end device can act as a client or as a server or as both. The intermediary devices, again, we're still talking about devices on the, on the network, okay? So we talked about end devices, and now we're talking about intermediary devices. Intermediary devices are switches and routers that can then get this information and facilitate the communication or the delivery of the content from one point to other points over the internet. So a router routes the information according to the information that it has now. And we'll talk about how. Okay? Um, switch does the same thing, but in a lower level. We'll talk about that. So uh, intermediary devices are responsible for the connectivity over the internet. It gets the information from one side and it delivers it to the other side. Um, so any network access devices like hub switches, wireless access points, you know, we have access point here. That's one of the intermediary devices, okay? So this is nothing but like a, um, a switch or a router, okay? But it has one side wireless, 
So that's the only difference. Okay, wild routers would not have this antennas. That's the only difference. Okay, so any inter-networking devices like routers, communication servers and modems, or security devices like firewalls. Firewalls are, you know, firewalls can be implemented fully in software. And these like services that, that provide protection, okay, to anyone to, a, to connect to the network. So it can block certain uh, 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 types of access uh, to the network. And uh, in some cases, these firewalls are hardware, and that's when we call them intermediary devices. So the, the, sometimes these firewalls are dedicated, are implemented on dedicated hardware, especially if we're talking about securing a, a large network like the network of the university, for example. But for securing our devices at home, in many cases, we run these firewalls as software because it doesn't have to be that sophisticated or that heavy. So it can be a very simple application and it takes care of the, of the information coming from our network. Because the information from our network is, is not that huge, right? But the information coming from the university or going out of the university is huge and that's where we need a dedicated hardware to take care of that. Okay? Okay, so we'll stop here.